Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Reasonable Accommodations and Modifications in Housing presentation brought to you by Disability Law Colorado. My name is David Monroe, and I'm the Managing Attorney of the Disability Law Colorado office in Grand Junction, Colorado. I'm very happy to be with you today and happy to get this opportunity to discuss this topic with you. Often when we do these presentations, one of the first questions we get asked is what is a protection and advocacy system and how did DLC become the designated protection and advocacy system for the state of Colorado? So by way of a brief history, in 1972, Geraldo Rivera went into Willowbrook State School and broadcasted videos from that facility of the squalid conditions that he found there, and they shocked the nation. In 1975, Congress enacted legislation to create PNAs throughout the U.S. In 1976, Disability Law Colorado was established, and in 1977, DLC was designated by Governor Richard Lamb as the PNA for the state of Colorado. And from 1977 to the present, Congress has consistently expanded the roles and the responsibilities of PNAs. Every state and territory in the U.S. must have a designated PNA. And our mission is to protect and promote the rights of individuals with disabilities through legal representation, advocacy, investigation, education, such as the presentation I'm doing with you today, and through legislative action. Some of the fair housing laws, which will be discussed in this presentation, include the Fair Housing Act of 1968, or the FHA, the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988, which added protection for people with disabilities, the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act, also known as CADA, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, commonly referred to as Section 504, and the American with Disabilities Act, known as the ADA. We will also touch briefly on local laws and ordinances. By way of a little history, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was intended as a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the bill was subject to a contentious debate in the Senate, but was passed quickly by the House of Representatives in the days following the assassination of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. The FHA stands as the final great legislative achievement of the Civil Rights Era. So I think the starting point for discussion of reasonable accommodations and modifications in housing starts with asking the question, who do fair housing laws apply to? And broadly and in the most general sense, these laws apply to most housing and vacant land intended to be used for housing. In practical terms, what this means is the fair housing laws are going to apply to almost all dwellings, including apartments, condos, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, HOAs, and privately funded or subsidized housing. Sometimes when discussing the applicability of fair housing laws, it is easier to talk about the exclusions because there are fewer of them. They include religious organizations, private clubs, a quarter fewer if the owner lives there, single-family homes, some senior housing, and any room offered for rent or lease in a single-family dwelling where the owner or lessee maintains or occupies a room in the household. And that last one comes from CADA, the Colorado law. A couple important things to know about exclusions. In religious organizations and private clubs, the intention is that the organization is going to make space available or housing available for members of the organization. So for example, if a religious organization runs a nunnery outside the city of Boulder, and I believe they still do, and only members of the religious organization live within that particular housing area, they have an exclusion from the fair housing laws. The same is true for private clubs. When we talk about a property that is described as a quad or fewer, think of one large building that has four units or fewer and the owner lives within the unit. When it comes to single family homes, there are some requirements that apply. It cannot have been advertised for rent by a realtor. The owner must have three homes or less and he must have advertised the home for sale in a way that is consistent with the Fair Housing Act. And what that means is they have to have put advertising out into the public that clearly is non-discriminatory. What constitutes discrimination? 
probably the most critical question that's going to be asked in this presentation and hopefully answered. And when you try to answer this question, it is important to think of the Federal Housing Act and the individuals that are protected by it. The FHA protects people from discrimination based on their religious beliefs, based on their sex, based on the fact that they are an individual with a disability. And you have to keep the people that are meant to be protected by the FHA and other housing laws in mind when you discuss what constitutes discrimination. When it comes to modifications and reasonable accommodations related to housing, it is against the law to refuse to show rent or lease or sell property, denying availability, unequal terms or conditions or privileges related to the property, different rents or security deposits, different rules for eviction or non-renewal, and harassment. It is also illegal to provide unequal maintenance and services on a property, higher interest rates or predatory terms, discriminatory advertising related to the property, blockbusting redlining or making property unavailable, denying reasonable accommodations or modifications, and retaliating against individuals who are protected by the FHA and other housing laws. By the way, in case you haven't heard the term before, redlining usually refers to the discriminatory practice that puts services, financial or otherwise, out of the reach of residents of a certain area based on their race, their ethnicity, or the fact that they are individuals with disabilities. In the most basic, practical, foundational sense, if you are treating someone differently because of their race, religion, gender, disability, or other protected trait, you are quite likely discriminating against them. Now that we've discussed the general background of fair housing law, we can move on to more specific topics, such as reasonable accommodations. And of course, the first question here is what is a reasonable accommodation? And what it is, is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling, and that includes the public and commonly used spaces. The most critical part of that definition is equal opportunity. All of this law is really related to creating equity when it comes to fair housing. When discussing reasonable accommodations, sometimes it's easier to use examples to help make it clear. And some examples we can share with you include creating an exception to the first come first serve parking policy in a large apartment. What that usually means is putting parking aside for individuals with disabilities that is closer to the apartment complex. It also includes allowing a tenant to pay rent by mail, or sometimes even allowing a tenant to pay rent a bit late because their Medicaid check does not come until later in the month. And it also includes allowing an assistance to animal in a no pet building. Another way of looking at reasonable accommodations is to ask what does the word reasonable mean in the term reasonable accommodations? You must do what is reasonable, but what does that mean? Usually you will see things discussed by the court in the following categories. Is what is being asked practical or feasible? Is it an undue administrative or financial burden on the person who is being asked to do it? Is it a fundamental alteration of the program or business being run by the people who are being asked to do it? And is it related to the person's disability in any way, shape, or form? Another question we get asked often is, can a landlord charge an extra fee for granting you a reasonable accommodation? And the answer is absolutely not. Housing providers cannot require people with disabilities to pay extra fees or deposits in order to have a reasonable accommodation request granted. And the best example of that is something we've heard about before called pet rent. There is no such thing as pet rent. You cannot charge an extra deposit in order to have a reasonable accommodation request granted. And that includes for assistance animals. Deposits for possible wheelchair damage to the carpet, fees for companion animals, late fees, or paying rent on the 10th due to SSI or SSDI benefit payments. These are all things for which you cannot be charged an extra fee by your landlord. 
Another important concept in fair housing is what is a reasonable modification, and that is a structural change made to an existing housing unit occupied or to be occupied by a person with a disability in order to allow that person full enjoyment of the housing unit. And examples of this include widening doorways, installing grab bars in the bathroom or other areas of the home, lowering the kitchen sink so it is accessible for a person in a wheelchair, or adding a ramp. Another question we get asked often at Disability Law Colorado is who has to pay for modifications to a housing unit? In a general sense, the FHA requires tenants to pay for such modifications. However, landlords that receive federal funds may be required to pay for modifications pursuant to Section 504. Whether your landlord is required to pay for modifications pursuant to Section 504 is a topic which is too complex for us to cover in this presentation. The best advice we can give is that if you are in a situation where you are wondering whether your landlord is required to make modifications to your housing unit, you should call Disability Law Colorado and ask to speak to one of our access attorneys. On the topic of modifications which are made by a tenant and restorations which must take place when the tenant is vacating the property, the following information is very important. Modifications are not limited to the interior of the dwelling. They can include common areas, entrances, hallways, and even areas outside of the unit. All of that work must be done in a workmanlike manner and all of that work must be approved by the housing provider first. And what this means in a practical sense is if you are considering making any modifications to your unit, even at your own cost, you need to speak to the landlord first and discuss those modifications. Now, when it comes to restoration of the unit when you are getting ready to leave, the interior must be restored before moving out unless it doesn't affect the housing provider or subsequent tenants use or enjoyment of the property. However, and importantly, the exterior or common areas do not need to be restored before you move out. A growing area of concern for us at Disability Law Colorado is the amount of information that landlords are trying to ask of individuals with disabilities at the very start of the process of trying to rent a housing unit from them. This is an area of concern for us because under the law, there really are a limited number of things that a landlord can ask you to start when you are trying to rent a housing unit from them. One of the most important things for us to discuss in this presentation, therefore, is what information can a landlord ask concerning accommodations and modifications? So let's assume that you're an individual who is seeking to rent a property from a landlord. The question becomes, what questions can the landlord require from the tenant? What proof can the landlord require from the tenant? The landlord can require proof of a disability if the disability is not obvious, and they can require that that proof come from the medical provider. What that means in a practical sense is if you are meeting your landlord for the first time and you are sitting in a wheelchair, your disability is obvious and they shouldn't need any more information related to your disability. Also, the landlord can require proof that the tenant needs a specific accommodation or modification that they are requesting and proof that they need that can come from a medical provider or anyone else who is in the know about the nature of your disability. And what the second part of that sentence means is if there's anyone in your life who knows enough about the nature of your disability to provide the information that the landlord needs, that person can be the one who gives the information to the landlord. What can the landlord not require? They cannot require full medical records, they cannot require you to use a specific form, although they can provide you with a form that makes providing the information easier to you. The landlord must respond promptly and without undue delay to your inquiries, and somebody other than the individual with a disability can request a reasonable accommodation for you if that is necessary. When it comes to an individual with a disability, asking for an accommodation or a modification and the type of things that the landlord can request of you in the form of proof, there are a couple great resources in this area, including the HUD DOJ joint guidelines. If the disability you have is obvious, the landlord cannot ask you for more documentation. 
If it is not truly obvious, they can. If the need for the accommodation is obvious, you cannot ask for more documentation. If the need for the accommodation is not obvious, you can. And again, by way of a practical example, if you are an individual who uses a wheelchair and you are seeking to rent an apartment or a home from a landlord and there is no way to access the apartment in your wheelchair without them building a ramp, your need for that accommodation is obvious and therefore they shouldn't be asking you for more documentation. In this presentation, we have discussed some complicated terms and definitions that come from the Fair Housing Act as well as other laws that relate to fair housing. But there's a bottom line when it comes to accommodations and modifications. And the bottom line is that the landlord has a responsibility to engage with you in an interactive dialogue about your disability and the types of accommodations and modifications that you may need in order to rent a unit from them. This means that when a tenant requests a reasonable accommodation or modification, the landlord cannot simply refuse it and say it isn't reasonable. The landlord has to make an effort to understand the tenant's request and try to come up with an effective solution that works for both parties. Deference is given to the person with a disability to describe what they need. This doesn't have to be in writing, although we absolutely and positively recommend that. There are no magic words that make something a reasonable accommodation. As long as the landlord understands the request is related to your disability, that being said, some very practical advice here is to make your reasonable accommodation in writing and to make the landlord fully aware that you are requesting a reasonable accommodation. If you are an individual with a disability and you have questions or concerns related to fair housing laws, or if something has taken place in your life when you were trying to rent property that you think may be a violation, of fair housing laws. There are many, many resources for you to access on the internet. We have listed just several of them here in this slide. We did want to point out that you can always go to the Disability Law Colorado website at www.disabilitylawco.org. In addition, we want you to know that there are several federal and state entities to which you can direct a complaint if you think you have been discriminated against in housing. That includes the Colorado Civil Rights Division, CCRD, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. It is critical for you to understand that at the time of this recording, which is September of 2020, both of these state and federal entities require that the thing you are complaining about has occurred within the last year. In a practical sense, what this means is if some event has taken place and you feel like you may have been discriminated against in housing, it is important that you file a complaint as quickly as you can if you intend to file one at all.